Hello and welcome to the i3 podcast. My name is Wouter Klein and I'm the Director of Content for the Investment Innovation Institute. For more information about our educational forums for institutional investors, please visit our website at www.i3-invest.com. There you can also subscribe to our complimentary newsletter, i3 Insights in which we discuss investment strategy and asset allocation questions with asset owners around the world. Now, as you all know, we love our disclaimers in this industry, so here's ours. This recording is for educational purposes only. It does not constitute financial advice. Please enjoy the show. In this podcast, I'm speaking with Vijoy Chatterjee, who is the founder and president of VMLH, a consulting firm for global institutional investors. Previously, Vijoy was chief investment officer of the 17.5 billion State of Hawaii Employees Retirement System. He is well known for implementing an investment philosophy that focuses on functional risk classes instead of asset classes, which led him to create the crisis risk offset sleeve to the portfolio. In this podcast, we are talking about the function of complexity in portfolios and how to set effective governance frameworks around this. Enjoy the show. Vijoy, you come all the way over from uh, Hawaii. How are you coping with the weather? Um, I guess I should say good day. Um, yeah, it is, uh, it is August when we're speaking here, and so that's quite a warm month up in the Northern Hemisphere, and uh, I almost forgot that uh, it's actually winter here in, in Australia, so it's a bit more uh, cooler than I'm used to, but fortunately I have uh, a lot of winter gear from all the years that I lived in cold weather climates, so I'm coping okay. Fijoy, can you tell us a little bit about how you get started in the asset management industry? Yeah, right. So um, I did come to it sort of mid part in my career and I started out always being interested in school in um, policy and economics and uh, finance in, in a sense that it helped me to better understand how the world worked. It seemed to me that, you know, you follow the dollars and that gave a lot of ideas about incentives and motivations for people. And so when I um, got out of school, I was a school teacher for a couple of years and um, I had attended a fundraiser for my university uh, while I was teaching and I mentioned to one of the directors of development that I was interested in maybe moving to Washington DC and getting involved in uh, policy and uh, I don't know if he lied to me but he said I don't know anyone in Washington but I, I know someone in New York so if you send me your resume I'll, I'll, uh, I'll forward it along and see what can happen and it turned out to be a, uh, an, a position that I was able to uh, get at the uh, Federal Reserve Bank in New York and that was perfect because it was the ideal mix of policy and uh, and economics. And uh, I worked on the foreign exchange desk as a as a, an assistant there, and uh, was able to participate in some market interven- interventions in the early '90s, which was then quickly reported in the news. A very rare occurrence, but I was there when some of them happened, and uh, that got me hooked. So I was like, I want to move to New York. I want to work in the industry. And over time, um, I was able to move to the buy side of the business after a couple of jobs. And uh, that, uh, again, kind of happened through a a person that I knew from my school days uh, and was looking for someone to come out and work with a group from Asia that was an asset management company, a Japanese asset management company, to, um, to help build a fund of hedge fund business. And he asked me if I knew of anyone that might be interested in that position. And I, I, I looked around and I, I came back to him and I said, I think that I can't find anyone except for one person and that's me. So I sort of <laughs> volunteered for the job and that, that took me onto the buy side. And uh, it, was, it was a great uh, opportunity because um, uh, my introduction on the buy side of finance was really in the absolute return um, hedge fund type world, which I think uh, was great training ground for uh, what I then did after that. Yeah, it's interesting to hear that you started out as a teacher because it's actually surprising to see how many uh, CIOs uh, started out as teachers and found their way into the investment industry. Um, So you've come to Australia on a bit of a study tour as well and uh, have been meeting with some of the Australian pension funds here. What are some of the things that strike you that are similar or or very different from uh, some of the pension funds in the US? 
Well, well, I have really appreciated the opportunity to meet with some of these um, large pension funds, these superannuation funds, um, separately uh, um, at the, the with the help of I three. That uh, it's amazing the the access and the network that you have to these very talented and smart folks in these different organizations. And so I've thoroughly enjoyed learning about their challenges and and what they face. I think um, you know I envy the the fact that a lot of them are very well funded and there's a commitment. To being funded and and that is also driving some of the changes and efforts they're making now uh, particular in their asset allocation mix and their even their um, positioning of their global portfolios to actually have presence overseas we'll see if that all materializes in the next few years but it's a very interesting challenge or problem to have rather than um, always having to face kind of um you know um, funding issues, which is sometimes the case for most plans in the United States. Not all, but, but a lot of them. Um, but um, in terms of uh, challenges uh, that, that, that uh, are, are similar, I think that, that all um, asset owners and institutional investors kind of face are, are things that have to do with, uh, you know, adding complexity to the portfolio from uh, in a world where you have very, very low rates for bonds. And so you can't rely on them to fund your, your requirements. Um, so finding other sources of return is, is a great challenge. And I, I admire what, uh, what the Australians are doing. Um, I think along those lines, adding complexity then inevitably means you have to consider the, the governance uh, structure and what changes you need there. And uh, I think that for the most part, the plans seem to be well governed, but they're going through changes because there's increasingly need to have your um, investment professionals take over responsibility for certain functions and actions um, in order to manage those more complex portfolios in a timely and dynamic way. And, and, and uh, the progress that's, made, making, that's being made there is, is really uh, um, impressive. Um, and finally, along those lines, the, the need to then communicate back not only to your trustees in terms of the activity and be fully accountable, but also to all the stakeholders, whether that's the members of a plan or the general community that has an interest in seeing um, the um, members uh, achieve retirement and not be kind of a burden in society uh, down the road. So these are these are terrific challenges that, that that all plans face. But I think in in Australia, for the most part, what I seem my impression is is that they're meeting that head on, and uh, that's a, that's refreshing and and impressive to see. Yeah, uh, governance is uh, definitely uh, high on the agenda for a lot of funds, and it is probably tied as well to as they become larger organizations, um, their activities expand. They become almost more um, like financial services organizations. Um, and with that, there is the interesting uh, um, dialogue between the board, between the investment committee and between the investment team uh, as far as asset management is concerned. Can you tell me a little bit about how you see um, sort of the best way of having those uh, dialogues and, and where the tasks of the investment team, the board and the investment committee end? Yes, ab- absolutely. And, and you know, one thing about uh, the, the governance and the way um, board members and investors and others interact with one another, um, it it's, can be very unique to each plan and program and even to personality types. So I don't think there's a one size fits all solution, but uh, there are sort of, you know, best practices or examples that people can look to. I think in terms of the, the, the best governance that you see out there with, with just sophisticated investors across the world, asset owners, is that you have a clear delineation of the, the task and the functions of the, the board, um, executive staff, and the investment team. Um, I think at the end of the day, you want to have your board members making very high level but important decisions about the mix of risky assets they want to hold and what they'll tolerate and the policies related to what they will not invest in, sort of the constraints that they want to put around. And ultimately, they are fiduciaries and they're responsible to the membership uh, and the beneficiaries for the health of that plan. And, and that should rest in their hands. And, uh, and uh, invest the investment team and CIO and others uh, should recognize that. And at the end of the day, that plan and that responsibility is belongs to them. Now, having said that, um, in terms of the role of the investment team and the, the CIO, um, they really should look at themselves as, a, as the um, group that executes the policy and the broad 
decisions that the board makes. And so um, they should then um, be accountable, responsible, and transparent back to the board in terms of their activities and their decisions and their performance. But the, the details, very um, day-to-day activities, month-to-month, quarter-to-quarter, um, those decisions should be made at the level of the person who is actually doing the work. So the CIO should make a lot of decisions, as you would think. But one of the, the key insights of being a chief investment officer or a senior investment manager is that you don't want to make, you want to make key decisions, not all the decisions. And so you should try to limit the decisions you make to those that really are impactful and material to the performance and the health of the investment program. And then to the extent that you trust and have talented uh, team, they should be able to bring their skill uh, to bear on um, selection, decision, due diligence, dealing directly with managers or investment strategies. And, and it's, not a, it's not as clear a line maybe all the time, but it moves back and forth. But you need folks who can make decisions that are trustworthy and have demonstrated skill. Yep, because the role of a CIO can differ quite extensively depending on the, the size of an organization as well. Some CIOs are very hands-on and make the final decisions on investment uh, implementation. But some CIOs are more at a, ma- a managerial level where they uh, almost think more about strategy rather than the day-to-day investment stuff. In, in an ideal world, where do you think uh, are the, sort of the three key roles of a, of a CIO? Uh, yeah, so for a CIO, um, like you said, it doesn't, there's not a one size fits all. I said that before. And, but some of that is dictated by the individual sort of expertise and personality. But for a, a larger part, really, the, the organization structure and in fact size, so far as size indicates access to resources, can often dictate, you know, to what extent do you want to have the CIO involved in specific decision making um, versus overseeing a program and dealing with other non-investment activities of the of the plan. And certainly if you're a larger plan and you have maybe deputy CIOs, your role can change. Um, you know, you see in, in corporate organizations, oftentimes the the, the, the top person at, a, at an organization is maybe outwardly focused, dealing with shareholders, dealing with the media, while there's a lieutenant, a, a vice chair or someone who's focused in on the day-to-day operations. I've seen that with large public plans in the United States, and that works for them. If you are a smaller plan and you don't have those sort of resources, then inevitably the, the, the chief investment officer will probably wear more hats and get more involved with the investment decision making. That could also be because maybe the staff is less um, experienced and so they need uh, more guidance from someone who has that experience. Um, So it it is again something that will depend, uh, be very specific to the plan, but at the end of the day whatever allows the program to be executed optimally is is the way you go and keeps people happy and motivated because that's obviously a a big um, part of of uh, managing people and, a, and an organization. Yeah, absolutely. And an extension of that, um, when we look at the governor's uh, policy, do you think that that should be the same for every organization in terms of its basic framework, or is that also more dependent on the size of the organization? Yeah, I've, I've been able to look at some governance policies over the years for different organizations. And um, for, the, for the most part, the details are going to be very specific. Um, different um, organizations, even similar like public pension plans, ha- could have slightly different objectives or timeframes in which they want to achieve their objectives. And that may indicate a different governance structure. So, you know, if it's a public plan that for whatever reason is only investing in liquid securities, um, you can have a, a governance structure where you know the decisions about hiring and firing managers maybe don't happen as often or are not needed to be made in a hurry. But if you add, for example, private equity to that kind of an allocation mix, the, the market dynamics dictate that sometimes you have to make a decision about funding a, a GP in a specific time frame that may not be conducive to, for example, you know, quarterly board meetings. 
Um, and if that's the case, then you do have to change the governance because of the need to respond and take advantage of those opportunities, but only because the board has decided that that is an asset class they want to hold. So governance would necessarily be a little bit different between those two types of plans. But overall, in terms of delineating um, responsibilities and delegating the um, accountability and performance to um, people who are closest to the actual investments, I think is probably um, a best practice. Yeah. To what degree do you think that um, governance is basically trying to have a official process around creating a good culture within an organization? I mean, we often talk about uh, um, how fiduciary responsibility fits in, how you have to have to focus on the best members. But government seems to be, when you bring it back to the essence, just best practice, the best way of doing things and fostering that within a team. Um, Would you agree with that? I think that um, you know it's always good to look and find best practice, and but you always have to bring it back and make sure that it makes sense for your organization and how it can make sense. And and sometimes that requires you know tinkering at the edges of what a best practice approach would be. Um, I, and and I think that that's uh, that's important. Um, I think that governance is a little bit different than culture building, in the sense that you know governance is a little more formal. And, um, and once it's sort of established, you want to stay with it where culture can be more fluid and you have to constantly be aware of a culture building and, and, and how that has an impact on the different people, uh, key people in the organization. But um, having said that, not one is necessarily more important than the other, but building culture and values, particularly on the investment side, is critical for the kind of work that uh, that a lot of um, asset owners have to do. They may not set out to become a, uh, a, a private sector group like a BlackRock or a Goldman because that's a very different organization, different culture. But the investment mindset of being skeptical, questioning, looking for opportunity, working hard to uncover something that's not easy to find, you know, re- positive returns. Um, that's something that all investors share as a culture. And if you want to have an investment team within your organization, even a government agency, you have to create the space in the room for people to be open and insightful um, and basically become investors. Um, If you don't want to necessarily build that sort of culture, then you're much better off um, outsourcing that uh, responsibility to uh, consultants or asset managers or groups that, that are able to build that culture and allow you to operate more flexibly in the uh, in the investment world. Yeah. So do you think that in the end, um, if you have a good governance framework in place, that that will be additive to investment returns? Will it show up at the end result? Without a doubt, I think that good governance will lead to better performance and a better investment program over the long term. Um, it's hard to sometimes measure that in the sense that if you don't make an investment because you have bad governance, no one's going to say, oh, well, you missed this investment. Um, and it's also difficult to measure because you don't control outcomes. So you can have a good governed program and you can have a bad governed programs, and the returns in terms of investment performance can be absolutely the same. Um, and you would say there's no difference due to the governance, but you're looking at the outcome and there's a lot of things that can affect outcomes that have nothing to do with anything you can control. You know, you get a tweet from the U.S. president. You, you, you have a, um, a inter- change in interest rates that the Board of Governors has decided that has some impact. And, and so that is out of your hands, out of your control, and it impa- but it impacts your performance. Um, but having said that, I, I, I think that's why you look at the governance and you'll find over time well-governed programs uh, do well. And the example I would give in the United States in the public plan side is there's some large plans who have independent investment boards that are still overseen by the, um, by the, the, the state governments that, that they operate, but the investments are allowed to, um, again, be built on and, and focused on a culture and a, a process that is really investor-centric. And so you look at places like Florida and Wisconsin and Washington State, and uh, they have performed exceptionally well over the long term. And one of their key distinguishing um, 
characteristics is strong governance. So where in this process do you bring back the member or the end beneficiary um, in, into place? Is that possible to build that into the governance process or is that just a function of doing well in your investment returns? I, I think that the member and the beneficiary of these programs mu must be in the forefront of every decision and every activity that you, you undertake. Uh, that's the whole sole reason for your existence. Whether you're a trustee that's charged with a fiduciary responsibility or in, or in the investment team charged with executing the, uh, the program of the trustees, um, every activity that you undertake at the end of the day must go back to saying, is this benefit fitting the members, the beneficiaries? And if it is, then it's worth undertaking. And if it's not, then you really have to question why you're doing that activity. It should prioritize how you do your work. And so at all times, that should be important. Now, bringing it to the, communicating that back to the ultimate members, there should be formal lines of communication in terms of, you know, quarterly newsletters, open and public meetings if you're a public entity. Um, but, um, you know, there are other ways more informally that you can conduct yourself or participate in community forums to, to communicate. But at the end of the day, you do need to have the trust and the confidence of your members, all your stakeholders, really, even beyond the members, you know, politicians, taxpayers, in order to have a well-functioning and successful program that everyone can support. Now, one of the, the key problems we have here in Australia, and I think it's pretty similar in the US as well, is that there's a very much awareness of what your peers are doing, the peer risk factor. Is it at all possible to build a governance process that addresses that? I think it's a fascinating question because the, the underlying um, experience of everyone in terms of looking at peers, whether it's in investment management or anything, is a very fundamental human trait. It's human nature to kind of want to know, are you doing as well as the folks across the street or you know down the road or who you went to school with? So I think it's very difficult in terms of a governance document to rule that out. I mean, you can formally say you're not allowed to look at uh, your peer returns to determine how you build your portfolio. And that makes a lot of sense. But inevitably, people will want to look at the outcome and see, okay, how are we doing? Should we do, be doing something that they're doing or doing something better? At the end of the day, the important thing is to remember that, first of all, you have no control over your peers and how they structure themselves, what their objectives are, what their constraints are, and why they invest the way they do. They take the risk that they do. Um, in fact, many times it's not transparent and you just don't know what they do. You only have the return as your answer to how they've done. So um, it's hard to compete in that sense. And you wouldn't want to compete in that sense. You want to Pay attention to what you need to achieve to be successful for your members and your program. But having said that, yes, you're going to look at how your how you fit in your peer universe and what goes on. So the way that I would deal with it is to try to understand your peers' performance in a broad context, not just in terms of a universe of peers and similar sized or characteristics than your your own program, but also what are the other performance metrics telling you about how you've done. So look at you, what your peers have done, but don't only look at your peers. Look at your absolute return. Look at your performance in relation to a benchmark if you go against a benchmark. Look at it in, 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 in relation to some funding level that you need to achieve and how, what direction and what trend you're going in. And so if you put it in that context, yes, okay, inevitably you wanted to see, am I doing better than you know, our competitor or whoever, um, if, that's, you know, if you think you have a competitor, but at the end of the day, if you have it in that larger context, that additional information gives you some better indication of are you executing your program as best you can. And at the end of the day, you want to do what's the best for your um, um, beneficiaries and members. And it doesn't really matter what the rest of the world is doing as long as you're delivering what you need to. Yeah, let's, let's talk a little bit about complexity. Um, you have a background in alternative assets and in hedge funds as well. Um, when you look at these instruments today, do you think there should be a large part, a small part, or, or does it depend on the organization itself? And then also, when you do embrace complexity, how do you best communicate that to stakeholders? Right, so I try to think about uh, complexity in a historical context where 
Um, in the past, you could define complexity as adding anything to a portfolio beside a bond. You know, bonds were considered a safe asset and anything else, stocks were speculative. Um, clearly, we've come a long way since then in terms of how to build a portfolio because bonds aren't always as safe as you think they are, depending on how their underlying characteristics are. And there's this concept of diversification. And so diversifying beyond just an exposure to an interest rate risk uh, is, is increasingly important. So then you come to today's world where you have really low interest rates and you have indexes that have uh, climbed and climbed for several years now. And you wonder, you know, is that really still, you know, what all you want to hold in a portfolio? Should you be diversifying? Should you be having other sources of return in the portfolio? And clearly um, investors are doing that. And so that by maybe by current definition is adding complexity into the portfolio. But it's adding complexity in a way that lessens risk or at least diversifies risk to other types of um, assets. And that, I think, is the, the key in terms of adding complexity. If you could go out and buy a long-term treasury bond from the U.S. that funded all your future liabilities and you didn't have to do anything else, why wouldn't you do it? You'd absolutely do that, and that would be the end of your investment program. The reality is you can't do that. So how do you go about um, meeting your objectives and designing a portfolio that does that but also reflects the nature and the um, how you think the world works? So in today's world, um, which is more complex in many ways, uh, there's more um, ways to measure and understand interactions, correlations between uh, different asset classes, you're going to want to um, have exposure to these new, newer strategies, different strategies. Um, but it comes back to saying, what are we trying to achieve? And then if I'm going to add this strategy, what does it do for my portfolio? Is it a risk-bearing um, asset that I need to generate higher returns? Is it a diversifying asset that allows me to lower the volatility or other measure of risk in my overall structure? Um, and that should sort of drive and dictate whether you should be increasing complexity or not in the portfolio. It's a functional reason to have a particular investment in the portfolio, functional in the sense of how it impacts the overall risk return characteristics of the entire portfolio, not just a particular sleeve of the portfolio. Because for most asset owners, most institutional asset owners, they are trying to achieve a return so that they can carry out their mission, whether that's giving pension benefits or scholarships or research grants and that's the reason they exist and the investment program exists and is designed to further that mission and and that's where it should be and now communicating that to your trustees to your stakeholders is is sort of essential obviously communication education is an ongoing process and when you bring in a um, strategy that is not familiar you have to take that extra time to try to help um, your um, fiduciaries, your beneficiaries understand what you're doing. Um, and that takes some, some skill in terms of um, being able to communicate, um, being able to design avenues of communication and feedback. Um, and so that is another important component of what, what you do. And that can be formal or informal in the way that you go about doing it. Yep. Is it at all helpful to think of asset buckets because we talked a little bit about hedge funds that can be um, growth oriented, that can be defensive. Um, should we move away from from um, asset allocation buckets, basically? So, when uh, in my own experience, I've um, built portfolios and, and, and at one time moved away from a traditional asset allocation structure to something we call a functional risk class structure, and uh, there were many advantages to doing that, particularly in providing more flexibility in, the, uh, in um, our um, efforts to diversify and look at different types of strategies because instead of trying to classify um, an investment into a particular asset bucket, we started more fundamentally looking at the risk return characteristics and understanding the underlying exposure that we had. And, and we would call things like growth risk or real return risk or inflation risk. Um, and so um, 
that was something that was important at the plan where I was working to do that. But the traditional asset allocation model doesn't necessarily uh, not have strengths. There are some great um, advantages to using that model. One, one advantage is that everybody understands it. So it's terrific to be able to communicate. People understand where a stock goes into a portfolio or a real estate investment. And so being able to communicate with uh, general stakeholders and even um, asset managers that bring you product for your portfolio, um, that can be helpful. So I think there are advantages and disadvantages to using both. Um, the extra effort to um, move away from the traditional asset class, I think, is a more um, comprehensive way to think about your investments in building a portfolio. I wouldn't necessarily forget the asset class, but I would tend to want to move in that direction. But it takes some work because you're creating language, you're creating um, the need to communicate it at a more intense level with your um, fund managers, with your stakeholders, with your trustees in order to be able to build that kind of a, a portfolio design. Yeah. So in terms of building that flexibility or that, that complexity into the portfolio, how do you then um, communicate that to, to stakeholders in the sense that do you think that, that, for instance, board members need to have a sophisticated understanding of, of uh, the financial services or um, is it okay for them to be more of a general representative of, of members? I, I, so, so in terms of you know who's governing an investment program at, at that high level, the fiduciary, do they need to have the investment expertise? They should have some familiarity with the way that um, business and finance works, obviously, which any educated person will, will have. Um, and and they, that should inform their view of how the world works. Now, do they have to be experts in, in options or you know stock selection? Not necessarily, but they should be able to ask, you know, they should learn over time in that position to ask good questions, insightful questions, and, and expect the, 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 the investments professionals team to be able to answer in a comprehensive and reassuring way. So I think that's, uh, that's one level that, um, that, that you can deal and communicate with the complexity. One of the key things about dealing with complexity or let's say new strategies in terms of balancing is you do have to show your trustees and your stakeholders that even if you're introducing a strategy that they're not as familiar with, what is it about the strategy that is maybe not unfamiliar? For example, is there an index? Is there a passive way to get the exposure? If that's the case, then you've done that all the time in the portfolio, investing in stocks and bonds. You have benchmarks, you have passive ways to get the exposure, you have active ways to get the exposure. So you've got to balance that in terms of showing um, your um, decision makers or your governance that you, what you're doing is not novel or unknown. There are similarities to the way you go about looking and making investments. And then you balance that with but this is a little bit different and this is the innovation and this is the function that we're in the the purpose that this strategy is bringing to the portfolio so when we, you talk about the complexity of hedge funds i don't really um, favor having an allocation to hedge funds i'd rather understand what's the underlying risk return characteristics of a particular strategy and then is it more growth like is it more um, interest rate driven what are the primary risks and then can I explain that strategy in terms of those fundamental risks and therefore why it belongs in the portfolio and show that the strategy is, has uh, similar features to other strategies that we already invest in and has a way to be measured and, um, and held accountable for its performance um, and then, um, that, then make a recommendation for why you need that in your portfolio to achieve your ultimate return objecti objectives and ultimately the mission of the organization. Yeah. All right. Final question. Um, you are well known for implementing a, a crisis risk offset strategy. Um, do you think that is suitable for every fund or is that particular to the type of organization? So let's be clear with the crisis risk offset class, it was it is really an offset. It's not a hedge. It was designed because of the particular circumstances 
of the plan I was working at at the time in terms of their challenges, which had to do with their funding level, negative cash flow out of the fund, and the, um, the experience of going through a couple of major financial crises within a 10-year period, which really depleted um, the funding level, which decreased the funding level. And so one of the risks that the fiduciaries identified was the, the thought that if they had to go through another drawdown of that nature, um, would the plan be sustainable? So given that, that experience and those characteristics, we said if we know we have to take growth risk, we know we have to be investing in risky assets, so if they were to sell off as dramatically, not even as dramatically as 2008, but even along those lines, how, how would we deal with that? And so we came up with the, the crisis risk offset class as a offset to the drawdown in the risky asset. Now, if I were at a different plan that, say, was more well-funded, like 100% funded, positive contributions coming in from the employers and the membership, there wouldn't necessarily be a reason to worry about that sort of drawdown in that the plan, because it's not needing to pay out assets at that time, could um, weather that sort of volatility, that storm. So it wouldn't necessarily be important for that program. However, some of the underlying strategies might still be in a portfolio of, of, of any institution um, because the underlying strategies are different types of risk. But to design it specifically to offset a drawdown in your growth risk, your equity assets, that's very particular to certain plans. And so while I've seen it adopted at, at a few places in the United States, it makes sense because of their experience and their um, plan characteristics. So I hope one day maybe I'll find myself in a circumstance where I don't have to worry about the next crisis. Uh, we should all be in that sort of um, situation. And then I would design a very different portfolio. Yes. Well, let's hope that there won't be any more crises. Fijoy, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us. Much appreciated. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the i3 podcast. For more information, please visit www.i3-invest.com. Thank you very much.